Hi, welcome back to Flipping Pages, Stirring Sauces. I want to say Tawada and my greatest gratitude to all of you who have liked, subscribed, shared, and have commented. I cannot do it by myself and a great effort has been made in order for these um, videos to go viral and I am truly grateful for your support and sometimes when we speak words of encouragement we do it because even words of encouragement have energy and when you sincerely um, offer your words of encouragement and offer other positive um, comments towards people, it has an effect. We don't just do it and say it for the heck of it. It is something that is innate and we do it because it has energy and that energy is transferred and I had no intentions of doing what I'm about to do but just before I started this video I was instructed to send this message out to someone and I am sending this message out to you. Congratulations on the pregnancy. I hope it's a girl and I hope that this pregnancy is successful. You've never asked for my forgiveness but I forgave you a long time ago. You need to now forgive yourself get some sleep you are young and the manner in which you handled things was juvenile you could have handled it differently you could have handled it in a better way but you handled it the way you handled it and you have to undergo the karma for that and um, I cannot change that situation for you but the way you behaved was wrong and you need to learn the lesson that has been imparted as a result of your actions so um, yes once again congratulations on the pregnancy and don't worry about how I know I know um, I'm gonna share a little story many years ago I sent my resume to a PO box and about a week later I was called into a manager's office for an interview. I had no idea what the job was about. I had no idea what I was being interviewed about. And when I got to the interview, the manager's name is Claire McDonald. I will never forget that woman. And it turned out to be an insurance company. And she asked me um, how I felt about working for an insurance company. And I said to her, I didn't know it was an insurance company. If I did, I would not have shown up for the interview. And she said, why is that? And I said to her that all insurance companies do is take people's money and when they die, that money goes to somebody else. That is all I knew about insurance companies. 
and I didn't see insurance companies as reputable, honest entities. And I had no desire to work for an insurance company. And by the end of the interview, she was trying to convince me of all the reasons why I should take the job. And I was trying to convince her of all the reasons why I shouldn't take the job. And she asked me about my supervisor at my other place of work. And I spoke honestly about my feelings about that supervisor. I told her that I didn't like her. I thought she was a two-faced hypocrite who spoke badly about people behind their backs and then smiled at their faces. And I won't mention her name here, but as she was walking me out after the interview, she said to me, your supervisor is my best friend. And if you got along with her, you and I wouldn't get along. And I thought, my gosh, she, um, there's no way this woman is still going to want me to work for her. And I thought to myself, how can she be trying to convince me to work for her when I spoke so negatively about her best friend? But what that woman did, she took her personal feelings out of it and she acted professionally. And as she walked me to the elevator, she said to me, where are you going when you leave here? And I said to her, my sister lives down the street and she has a new baby. So I'm going to go hang out with my sister and her new baby. And I am going to hug my nephew and kiss him up and smell his newness and play with him on the floor. And she said to me, what is your sister's phone number? And I said to her, I gave her my sister's phone number and I kept wondering, why is this woman asking for my sister's phone number? It took me about 20 minutes to get to my sister's place from where I had the interview. And when I got to my sister's place, my sister said to me, your manager called. I said, my manager? I don't have a manager. She said, your manager from the insurance company called and she wants you to start work on Monday at 8.30. And I thought about it. And I said, you know what? That woman has guts. I am going to report for work on Monday at 8.30. I'm not going to argue with her anymore. And I reported for work on Monday at 8.30. And I was thrown into the world of insurance. And they were getting rid of the old insurance policy and bringing in no fault insurance. And I remember I reported for work and then she said to me, you will be going to the United States of America to study everything about insurance and I thought wow the United States of America me going to the United States of America by myself where I don't know anybody I don't know anyone 
I was going to Long Island and I reported for work. I worked for a few weeks and then I was on a plane to Long Island and I was there for six weeks and I met some interesting people but every morning we had to get up and go to class and if you didn't pass the test at the end of the course you didn't have a job and I passed the course in flying colors and I remember when I was there my sister-in-law came down my brother came down my ex-husband Michael my best friend came down and we had a fantastic time and I went shopping and sent all of the stuff that I bought back with my brother, my sister-in-law, and my husband. And I remember I was coming back and I got to the airport here, Pearson. And the immigration officer dug up my luggage. What were you doing in Long Island? I was studying. Do you have a portfolio? Were you modeling? I know I was there learning insurance. And then she came across my learning, my manual with all my notes and everything. And she thought that she had hit the mother load. And she was smiling. Yeah, we've got you now. You were there working and blah, blah, blah. And she opened it and she was very disappointed. It was all notes. And I don't know what she thought, but she took all my stuff out of my suitcase and was on the counter. And she said to me, you can pack it up now and go. And I said to her, no, you can pack it up. And when you're finished packing it up, I will go. Michael was waiting for me for 45 minutes. I was not going to pack my luggage up because I told her the truth in the beginning. She didn't believe me. And I finally asked to speak to her supervisor. When the supervisor came, I explained the situation to her. And the supervisor made her pack my luggage up neatly. And I took my luggage, and when I came outside, my husband said, why were it? Because at the time, the way the airport was set up, you could see people inside from outside. And he said, 45 minutes, 45 minutes you stood there. I said, yeah. And he said, you kept me waiting for 45 minutes because you refuse to pack your own luggage up. I said, yeah. because she convinced herself that I did something wrong and I was hiding something and she was going to find it, I stood my ground and I would have stood there forever. Anyway, when I got back, I asked the manager, Claire McDonald, why did you hire me when I spoke so negatively? about your friend and she said to me you were honest about your feelings you were honest about the way she made you feel and I hired you because of your honesty 
And she said to me, there's a spirit about you. You've got a spirit, a spirit that will not be broken. And I worked at that company and when Claire left, she moved on to bigger and better things and she met a nice rich man and fell in love and um, that was one of her greatest wish was to find somebody to fall in love with because um, she said I could stand naked on a beach and nobody would even notice. So when she met this wonderful rich man and fell in love and decided to move to the USA, I was very happy for her because she moved into a better position and she was moving up in the world and she gave me a great opportunity to learn about myself and to learn about the world around me and to learn about others and I'm truly grateful for her for that opportunity. When I did come back to Canada I had to unlearn everything that I learned in the USA but it was an American company and Part of the requirement of being hired with them is that you had to go to the U.S. to learn the U.S. system of insurance. But the thing is, every state has a different insurance policy. And it was completely different from the insurance policy in Ontario. But um, I worked with that company for quite a few years until we moved to another location and we had a new manager and that manager refused to see my worth and even when we got salary increases my increase was made based on his personal feelings against me and he did not like me and it got to the point where I decided it was time to move on and I applied for another job with another company and I was successful and that job was paying me 15,000 more per year than I was making where I was. They didn't see my worth. When I decided to leave, they decided to match whatever the other company was going to pay me. I said no. They decided to add 5,000 over and above it, I said, no, it wasn't about the money. If they offered me a hundred thousand more, my answer would still be no. It was about my self-respect. It was about my worth being recognized. It was about you need to treat me with respect. You knew my worth and you undervalued me and I wasn't having it and when I worked for that company I did multi-line insurance I did house claims automobile um, claims and I dabbled a little bit in accident benefits and when I got hired at the new company the um, about three weeks after working there doing multi-line a new manager was hired his name was John Reynolds and that man gave me wings I'll never forget him and I will always be grateful to him and he called me one day and he was very relaxed. He had a way of just sitting back in his chair and chewing on his pencil or his pen. And, you know, the, the, the way he talked, he, he talked to you with such dignity and respect. And, and he said, you know, I think you should move into the accident benefits part of the claims department. I think you would do very well there. And I said to him, I 
hate accident benefits. If people are not crazy before they get injured in these motor vehicle accidents, they become crazy as a result of their injuries. And he said, I think you would be a good fit. And I think that you should um, move into that department and do accident benefits. And I said to him, do I have a choice? And he said, no. I'm taking the choice away from you and I'm moving you there because you don't see in yourself what I see in you and I think you would do a terrific job and his approach was so different it put me at ease and I remember those words, you don't see in yourself what I see in you. And it reminded me of Claire when she said she sees something in me. And anyway, I moved into that department and soon I was loving accident benefits. And while other adjusters looked for reasons not to pay claims, I looked for reasons to pay claims. Because the way I looked at it is people pay their insurance premiums. And if they're truly injured, then they should be compensated for those injuries. And I often looked at some of my claims and I thought to myself, my gosh, I determine whether this person eats or sleeps or whether they have a roof over their head. How I handle their injuries and direct their recovery process will determine whether they eat, whether their houses are clean, whether their children have food. And I decided then that if a benefit was owed, I was going to pay it no matter what. And Working as an accident benefits adjuster allowed me to go out on the road, go to accident uh, scenes, take pictures, see if the accident happened the way that people said it happened. It allowed me to go into people's homes and take statements from them. And that training never leaves you. I would interview people and I would have two people sitting in the passenger seat behind the passenger on top of each other and the next seat was empty. And I would think to myself, how, how, why would they do that? How is that? And I started looking at claims handling like a puzzle. And I would take the pieces of the puzzle apart. And I would put them back together. And if they didn't fit neatly, I knew somebody was giving me a six for a nine. And if you gave me a six for a nine, I was going to do everything in my power to expose you. But, I would always give them a chance to come clean with me. And I would ask them, are you sure you were in the passenger seat behind the passenger and not behind the driver? And they would say yes. 
And then the other person in the car would also say, yes, I was in the passenger seat. And you know, the pieces of the puzzle wasn't fitting together properly. I had situations where there was a newborn baby three days old and five adults were in the car at the accident scene for three hours because they had to wait for the police officer to get there. The mother of this newborn baby was in the car. So if you were all in the car, was the baby in the car? No. Well, where was the baby? The baby was at home. Well, did you leave a newborn baby at home by themselves for three hours? Yes. So now, what are we looking at? Irresponsible parents or people who are lying about an automobile accident just so they could claim $400 a week. And then you had to look at that and make a decision. If I denied a claim, it was because that person was not entitled to that benefit. Because I did everything in my power to find a way to pay a claim if it was owed. And my father never allowed us to be hungry. We never knew hunger because my father was that kind of man. Everything he did, he did for his children, and we were not allowed to be hungry. My children are not allowed to be hungry. Everything I do, I do for my children. And when people try to take food out of my children's mouth, protective mother in me comes out and that's what tonight is all about exposing hypocrisy exposing the lies and making sure that anyone who tries to take food out of my children's mouth is punished and punished severely. So this is David. And Goliath is about to run headfirst into David. Copyright disclaimer. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Now, this is what is happening in England.
teachers class in classrooms yeah. and the department and the Department for Education will shortly remove national guidance uh, on their use in communal areas. In the country at large, we will continue to suggest the use of face coverings in enclosed or crowded spaces, particularly when you come into contact with people you don't normally meet, but we will trust the judgment of the British people and no longer criminalise anyone who chooses not to wear one. The government will also ease restrictions further on visits to care homes, and my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, will set out plans in the coming days. Mr Speaker, as we return to Plan A, the House will know that some measures still remain, including those on self-isolation. My gratitude to the gentleman who sent that to me. I have no idea who he is. But somehow, he got a hold of my phone number and forwarded that to me. And so now, where's my pen? Where is my pen? My pens are always running away from me. Where is my pen? Anyway, as I stated before, that on Monday last week, January 10th, I wrote to the union and made certain requests of the union. And Amkar Maharaj did not get back to me. So, this morning, I followed up with him, and he responded to me with some nonsense. So, I'm trying to find what he wrote to me. And this is what he wrote to me. Good morning, Arlene. The Article 10.01a II in the CBA refers to disciplinary measures. Purulator did not discipline you, but put the non-compliance members to their co to their Big C 19 policy on an unpaid leave of absence, as I explained to you verbally on January 11th. Teamsters Local Union 938 did not agree with Pure Later COVID-19 policy, filed a grievance with the company, which the company denied, and as per the dispute mechanism in the CBA, Article 8 and 9 is proceeding to arbitration. Hopefully, this response will answer your inquiry. Now, if you've put somebody out of their job without pay because they refuse to drink the Kool-Aid, that is a disciplinary action. And the disciplinary action that um okay what i had written to him on january 12th is um what i had written to him this morning was this is further to my correspondence to you dated january 12 2022 to date i have not had the courtesy of a response when will Purulator Inc. be complying with the subject article of the collective agreement? And the subject line was um, Article 10.1A II of the collective agreement. And I also wrote, I understand that temporary agency workers have now been employed to carry out the job tasks of the dues-paying members of the bargaining unit 
who have been illegally put on unpaid leave of absences by Pure Later Inc. What is the Canada Council of Teamsters doing to address our grievances regards Arlene? He refused to address that part of my queries and instead sent me the mumbo jumbo that I read before um, putting people off on leaf without pay is a disciplinary action especially somebody who suffered multiple injuries on the job who was on modified duties at the time somebody who cannot just walk out there and get another job because of my injuries as a result of the negligence of pure later five different times but it's not a discipline so I wrote back to Hamkar Maharaj, the business agent. Good morning, Mr. Maharaj. Please direct me to this section of the collective agreement that Pure Later Inc. is relying on in order to put people off on unpaid leave of absences. Further, what is the date that the arbitration is set for? Failure to provide said date by the end of the day today will result in a formal complaint to the Labour Board about the Canada Council of Teamsters inaction and tardiness in abiding by the rules of the collective agreement. So he has until midnight, which is another 17 minutes. Should it come to that, I will be asking the Labour Board to take over this matter and assign an arbitrator. Please govern yourselves accordingly and be mindful that you are paid to provide a service to your members, not the other way around. The behavior of your president in running out of a meeting and hiding from its members leaves a lot to be desired. And the failure of your shop stewards on the advice of Ronald Robinson not to meet with us and to take our grievances goes a long way in exposing the corruption between Pure Later Inc. and the Canadian Council of Teamsters. All of you can be replaced. I was instrumental in having Teamsters kicked out of a company at Pearson International Airport. And if Teamsters do not start behaving in a manner that is in the best interest of Local 938, I will personally pick up that torch again and run with it. By myself, I got members to sign 1,200 cards to remove another union from Pearson International Airport, the one that replaced Teamsters. My resume is extensive when it comes to fighting unions and their corruption. Do not test or underestimate me. Silent rivers run deep. Regards, Arlene. So, when we were told by Ronald Robinson that Rohan Kalu would never say he's not coming out to meet with us. I said that to my colleagues when Ronald Robinson told us that Rohan said he's not coming out. And a little bit of digging as revealed that Ronald Robinson told Rohan Kalu not to come out and take our grievances because Arlene is out there 
and she's going to argue with you and she's going to ask you a lot of questions. Ronald Robinson, you've interfered in union business once again where you have no business sticking your nose. I'll get back to that. Now, Pure Later Inc. has given $2,490 off my hard-earned, unkooladed dollars to the Canada Council of Teamsters Local 938. As far as I'm concerned, this is money that they've not earned. And they're going to have to earn their pay or they're going to have to return that money because as far as I'm concerned, it's theft. So, get your devices. My brothers and sisters of Local 938, get your devices, get your pens, get your pencils, get your papers, etc. Everyone who is a member of Local 938 needs to get pen and paper right away or get your devices. You all need to have this information. Anyway, I'm sure you can back this video up and get this information. The president for your local, your local is 938, is Craig McInnes. Last name M-C-I-N-N-E-S. McInnes. The vice president is Vince Johnson. The secretary treasurer is Bob Miles. The recording secretary is Mike Broderick. Teamsters Local Union 938 is located at 275 Madison Boulevard East. Mississauga, Ontario, L4 Zebra 1X-ray 8. Their telephone number is 905-502-0062. Their fax number is 905-502-0076. Their email address is info at teamsters938.org. Their website is www.teamsters938.org. Now, Teamsters, they're under the impression that we work for them. Teamsters need to realize that they work for us and not the other way around. Now, they are currently negotiating with Purelator Inc. We want to be a part of that negotiation. And we want penalties for Purelator when they fail to abide by the collective agreement. Now, personally, we get 52 paychecks per year, 45 out of my last 52 paychecks was messed up. I wasn't paid properly. They've been incorrect. And Article 21.3 of the Collective Agreement State 21.3 of the collective agreement state error on the paycheck shortage in the event of an error on the paycheck of an employee of forty dollars gross earnings or more attributable to the company 
the company will correct this error on the working day following notice, provided that the employee notified management of the error by 1 p.m. Eastern Standard or Daylight Savings Time. In the absence of such a request, the error is corrected on the next paycheck of the employee. So, whenever Pure Later, 45 out of 52 times, have screwed up my pay, I've always given them notice as per the collective agreement and asked for payment as per the collective agreement. I have never been paid as per the collective agreement. They always seem to want to hold on to my money that I've earned until the next pay period. The collective agreement says that they have to pay the next day. But the collective agreement doesn't outline any punishment or any penalties if they do not pay as per the collective agreement. So Pure Later have no, um, what would you say? They have no desire to pay as per the collective agreement. They pay when they feel like it because there are no penalties. So, in this collective agreement that they're currently negotiating, we want this clause left in. And we want this clause with penalty that they pay 2% interest per day for every day that they're late paying us when they screw up our pay. I've spoken to people at Pure Later who was waiting a month to be paid. I've spoken to people who worked a whole week plus overtime and they got paid $35. And Pure Later is not on the fast track to pay these people as per the collective agreement because there are no penalties. We want penalties negotiated as a part of the new collective agreement. Now, Article 2205 of the collective, uh, collective agreement state, any employee may exercise a right of refusal to perform work consisting, constituting an imminent danger, the whole in compliance with the provisions of Article 128 following of the Canada Labor Code. Now, I pointed this section out to Gary West on numerous occasions and still he refused to put me in a location which was safe. He kept me in a location which was unsafe, even after I provided medical documentation to say that I shouldn't be working in that location. He refused to move me even though my knees, which were injured in a work-related accident at Purilator, were swollen and painful. He kept me in that position where I was getting hit in my already injured knees and on my already injured foot. Article 23.2 indicate First aid with when an employee is injured at work, the company undertakes to give him first aid and to provide him with transportation at the company's expense to the closest hospital or medical clinic if the gravity of the injury so requires. Now, January 15th, 2020, 
I fell at work as a result of negligence on the part of a manager and injured both my knees. I was not provided with first aid. And again, later on, let me just get the correct date here. On March 19th, 2020, somebody left a pump truck in the path where I needed to walk in order to get to the back to put some boxes in a bin. And I tripped over those pump trucks, that pump truck, and re-injured my knees that were already injured. And that time I requested to go for first aid, I was denied. I was made to sit in the lunchroom for 20 minutes while the manager went about his business. And in the meantime, my knees were swelling up, my toe was swelling up, and I was in severe pain. The manager never reported the incident to Pure Later. I reported the incident to Pure Later twice. Pure Later to the date has not acknowledged that injury. And I never got first aid. Article 23.02, that was that one. Twenty three point oh three Article twenty three point oh three paid regular schedule. If a regular employee after starting work meets with a work related accident which incapacitates him from carrying out his duties, he shall be paid his regular schedule hours for that day, provided he is not in receipt of compensation from the workers' compensation board for that day. Now, on just want to check the date here. What was the date? September 30? Yeah. On September 30, I was hit in the head at work at Pure Later by a 26 pound tube. It was over six feet tall, and I was hit in the head with that tube. I was sent to the hospital by taxi, and yeah, I'm just looking for the um, looking for the file yes so I was sent to the hospital by um, I was sent to the hospital by taxi and while at the hospital, I kept falling asleep. And the doctor diagnosed me with a minor head injury. On my return from the hospital to Pure Later, Inc., I provided Gary West with a copy of the doctor's report which stated that I should 
take the remainder of that shift off and rest and that I should take the following day off from work and rest. Now what Pure Later Inc. did, they advised the taxi to take me back to Pure Later after my appointment with the doctor. And I told Gary West what the doctor said. Gary West said to me, oh, those are just general terms for everybody. And what they did was they forced me to go back to work after I had this head injury. So, after my shift, I went back to the hospital because Gary West and Ali Shabid threatened to write me up for insubordination if I did not sign the modified work order and return to work even though the collective agreement states that I should be paid for the rest of my shift if I became incapacitated while working and I have Dr. Lee's report here which clearly states that I should be off work for the remainder of the shift and the next day. The next day, they try to force me to come to work. And they arbitrarily took my personal day and told WSIB that I did not miss any time from work as a result of the accident at work, which is a lie. And to date, Pure Later has not returned my personal day, even though WSIB claims that they've compensated Pure Later for that. Pure Later has an obligation to Accommodate me. They ignore the doctor's report. And the person who I fell asleep that night while being driven home. I fell asleep while being driven to the hospital. I fell asleep while being driven back to Pure Later. And I spent the next day sleeping. I had a terrible headache for five days and spent a lot of time sleeping. No. I believe I already spoke about the right to refuse um, unsafe work. Yes, I did do that. Oh, I was so organized and now I'm not. 23 23.05 uh yeah and for the rest of that day I ended up working the rest of that day. But 23.05, what does 23.05 say? Oh, there isn't a 23.05. Okay. 
22.05. Yes, I covered that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'd asked you to get your um, pen and paper and whatever. You need, all of you, need to write, fax, phone, email, Canada Council of Teamsters, and request a copy of the grievance that they claim that they filed in September 2021. You also need to request a copy of the arbitration application that they claim they submitted. You all need copies of any and all correspondences between them and Pure Later Inc., as well as a list of the arbitrators that they use. These people work for us, and they're going to earn their money. So, I don't care if you fax, email, whatever. Whatever form you choose, you need to request this information. They are going to work for the money they're taking from us. We want regular weekly updates on how things are progressing. So, mass email, text, phone, whatever. Request this information. We need to be kept up to date as to what is going on. They are not just going to run the show and we're going to sit back and they're going to... Canada Council of Teamsters collect over $1.5 million per month of our money. We need to see what they're doing for that money. And we want input in the current negotiations. If we're not satisfied with what the company is offering, we are all going to vote against this new collective agreement that they're negotiating. We want to have our say. We want to see what is in that collective agreement before it is presented to us to be voted on. Now, Pure Later Inc. have brought in little 90-pound girls who have only been in the, in the country, some of them two to three weeks, to do our jobs. Some of them can't even pick up a 20-pound box without asking for help. We want an end to this illegal activity. They are here as students. They're only allowed to work 20 hours a week. And they have no right to take away the job of Canadian citizens. Pure Later have no right putting us on unpaid leave of absence and putting temporary students who cannot do the job in our positions that needs to come to an end. My brothers and sisters who are still working, do not help them to do our job. Stand with us. Because when you start refusing to continuously drink the Kool-Aid, you are going to be in the same position that we're in right now. And these same students... These 90 pound students who have been in the country three weeks are going to be doing your job. Think about that. Canada Council of Teamsters, what do you plan to do about these students putting Canadian citizens and your card carrying members out of work? And now, on to Ronald Robinson. Back to you, Ronald Robinson. 
You lied to us about Rohan Kalu. You said he refused to come out and take our grievances. When the truth is, you told him not to come out because I was out there and I would be arguing and asking too many questions. Once again, you have interfered in the grievance process. I'm, I'm a collector. I'm a collector of time, dates, places, times, events. And I'm going to remind you of an incident, actually two, when you have interfered in the grievance process. Now, I will just read this. Let me see which one happened first. May. May 12, 2020, around 4.10 p.m. I arrived at security and was being screened. I was being asked questions about being out of the country. I responded that the border is closed. The screener wanted a yes or no answer. I thought that it was a redundant question. Then he started asking me medical questions about other people living in my home. I told him I didn't know anything about their medical status and that I was not at liberty to discuss other people's medical conditions with anyone. They wanted to know if I was in contact with anyone with Big C-19. I said I didn't know, which was the truth. The screener kept insisting that it was a yes or no question. I'm a literal person. It wasn't a yes or no question. It was a I did not know because I did not know. He got upset and called for Romel Khan to come out. When Romel Khan came out, he wanted me to call the other adults living in my home to ask about their medical situations. I refused and asked for my union rep to come out. Romel Khan said I should go home if I'm not going to answer the questions with a yes or no. And if I wasn't going to call home to find out about the people's medical conditions, then I needed to go home. When the union rep arrived, I explained the situation to him and he had a talk with Rommel and Rommel left shortly after and went back inside. I decided to go back in the lineup and have another screener screen me. I was screened by another screener and allowed in. On the same date, at 5 p.m., I was working in Building B when Ronald Robinson came over. He called me off the line over to where he was and said, Rommel said he sent you home. I said to him, at that point, Wayne Squire, one of the managers, offered his office to Ronald Robinson, stating that it was more private. Ronald Robinson turned the offer down, stating that we can talk right here. Ronald Robinson basically said to me that if I can't answer the questions, I can't come in to work. I stated to him that due to the Privacy Act, I cannot discuss anyone's medical situation with him or anyone else. He again told me that I can't come to work if I don't answer the questions. I said to him, you guys don't understand the Privacy Act, and I am in here, aren't I? He started yelling for me to sue him. I walked away and went back to work. A few minutes later, Ronald Robinson called me over and asked if my shift is Sunday to Thursday. I said yes. He then told me, you are scheduled to work in unload 
only. Don't come back over here. No one else in the company is limited to working only in one department. That is differential treatment, which is illegal. To cover his tracks, he did send three other people back to the main hub shortly after I was sent over. Ronald Robinson's ego was bruised. I stood up to him and he was trying to punish me. So anyway, in the following weeks, he sent everybody back to work in Building B, even those who worked Sunday to Thursday. I was the only one who was not allowed to work over there anymore. That's Ronald Robinson interfering with the process. The matter was settled, but he has no confidence in his managers, so he micromanages them, and he came and stirred up a situation which was already settled. Very unprofessional on his part, and he behaved in a very unprofessional manner and challenged me to sue him. Well, I'm doing just that. The other incident occurred on August 10, 2020 at around 9.35 p.m. I was working in door number 18, unloading a trailer. When the trailer left, I started throwing freight on the conveyor to pass the time while waiting for the next trailer to arrive. The freight was finished, so I decided to take some mail down to the mail area. I delivered the mail and came back to door number 18 with a bin of freight that I took from the mail area. I threw that freight up as well, and there still didn't seem to be a trailer for me to unload in door number 18. I took a box of mail down to the mail area, emptied it onto the conveyor, and disposed of the box. I was pumping up a bin of boxes from door number three to take back with me to door number 18, just in case the trailer was not there when I got back. Ali Shabid saw me taking the bin and told me to take another bin, which had mail and bulk in it back with me. Brian, one of the, the, the forklift drivers, said not to worry about the bin. He would take care of it. I said to Ali Shabid, Brian said he would take care of it. I pointed out that, I pointed out to Ali Shabid and asked why and asked why he wanted me to take a bin with bulk and mail out of the mail area when someone had obviously brought it there to be processed. He started shouting at me, didn't you bring a bin down here not too long ago? I was at a loss as to why he was asking that question because I had brought a bin with just mail in it to be processed which I ended up putting on the conveyor myself. I said, why do you want me to take a bin with me with bulk and mail in it back to my work area? He started shouting, I am the manager and I want you to clean up this area. I said to him, I'm working a trailer. He shouted at me, I am the manager and I want you to clear this area. It doesn't matter. Didn't matter that I was working a trailer. I picked up the bin with the pump truck and took it over to where we put the mail bins. He came over to me, Arlene, 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 this is what I want you to do. I want you to process the mail. I said to him, you have all these people working down here. Why? Are you 
stressing me out. Because he had a whole host of people there working on the mail. I was working in a trailer. I was assigned to work in a trailer. The only reason I was down there was to drop off some mail because I was waiting for the next trailer to arrive so I could unload it. Every time you see me, you feel you have to give me something to do. He started yelling at me again. Several times during the conversation, I asked him not to speak to me in the manner that he was speaking to me. I asked him to stop stressing me out. He continued yelling at me. At that point, I told him to move out of my way because I was starting to feel panicked. He was still standing in my way. So what happened is, the wall was behind me and he was in front of me and and there were bins and other stuff there so i felt really panicked so i brushed past him to get away from him i went upstairs and advised lisa that i needed to file a complaint she wanted to know what happened but I was having trouble talking and breathing. I think she told me to sit down and calm my breathing or something like that. She called for Gary and Rohan Kalu, but none of them were available. Sir Arthur Brown came up and told me to write everything down and we will discuss it tomorrow. I found Ali Shabid to be very rude, abrasive, and abusive in the way he spoke to me. We are treated and spoken to like farm animals at Purelator by the managers. And it's time it stops. So, that incident occurred on August 10th. I filed a complaint against Ali Shabid. And nothing was done about it. It was tossed aside. However, I was written up for insubordination a few days later. So I filed a grievance. That occurred around, that grievance was filed around August 14th, I believe. Yeah. The grievance was not heard until October 28, 2020. That's another thing. Local 938 is a big enough local to have our own business agent that deals with only our grievances so that our grievances can be heard in a timely manner. September, October, two months later, that is not a reasonable amount of time for a grievance to be heard. I had a grievance which took six months to be heard. That is unreasonable. We are paying for a service and we want our grievances heard within a week of it being filed. Present at that grievance meeting was Charles, Rohan, Jennifer Nguyen, Amkar Maharaj, Ronald Robinson, Chris, and a gentleman by the name of Mark. So, during that grievance, I brought up the fact that there they were trying to discipline me for insubordination, but that my grievance and my complaint against 
Ali Shibad was not addressed. And then Jennifer Nguyen claimed that she had a meeting with myself and Rohan in which she told me that it was investigated and she and I was told that um, nothing came of it. So I said to her, we had no such meeting. You're not being truthful. And she said, yes, we had a meeting. So I said to her, if we had a meeting, what date was it on? She couldn't provide, she couldn't provide a date. I said, if we had a meeting, who is the manager you call to excuse me from my duties? She couldn't provide a manager. And I said, who was present at the meeting? Oh, it was you and Rohan. Well, Rohan couldn't remember any such meeting. And I insisted that that meeting didn't take place and no investigation of my complaint ever took place. So, Charles and Mark started speaking up and requesting her notes. Because apparently if a meeting took place, she's supposed to have notes about the meeting. She had no notes. She couldn't find them, she said. So then Charles insisted that she was not being truthful. And Mark insisted that we're not treated with any respect. And when they pushed Jennifer Nguyen, because they, know, they knew she was lying, Ronald Robinson said to his, his subordinates, watch it, watch it, watch it. That is a direct threat. to a union representative. That is Ronald Robinson interfering with the grievance process. That is Ronald Robinson saying, watch it. I am your superior. You're, an insubor you're, you're a subordinate. Watch it. I can affect you. Watch it. interfering with due process. And the guys, they shut up after that. It was so silent in there, you could hear a pin drop. So, Amkar Maharaj asked me if there was anybody I could produce to confirm my side of the story. I said to him, I don't know. There were a lot of people there. And I said to him, why not review the camera? Immediately he said to me, oh, there's no sound on the camera. Well, I didn't care about the sound. I cared about the action and the fact that Shabid Halley had me cornered. And it would show the actions of what took place. Anyway, when Ron Robinson decided to intimidate his subordinates, that basically ended the grievance. So, the next day, I went and spoke to some of the people because um, Ron 
said that they did their investigation and the investigation showed that I moved the bin to door 121. I have no idea where bin 120, where door 121 is, but what I do know is I moved the bin to where we put the bins that have mail and bulk in them to be processed. He said that Brian claimed that he moved the bin. Now, if Brian moved the bin, how did Brian move the bin that I moved? They said that my story didn't match Brian's version of what took place. And my thing is, if you view the camera, if you view the security footage, you will see that I was speaking the truth. I was telling things as they happened. So anyway, on the 26th of I said that was the 28th, that was the 25th of October, 2020, not the 28th. On the 26th of October, at 7.13 p.m., I left a message for Hamkar Maharaj, advising him that I did speak to somebody who saw what happened and that person is willing to come forward and confirmed, confirm what I said. Because after they made this statement, I decided to go back and speak to some of the people who were present when all of this was happening. And... I asked a couple people and they confirmed my side of the events. And the thing is, nobody noticed that every time I complied with what Ali Shabid asked me to do, the situation changed. It went from taking this bin with you to clean up this area to I want you to process the mail. So anyway, this individual said to me, you can give them my name and have them come speak to me. I saw what happened. And this is what happened. And he told me exactly what I had told them happened. I didn't ask him to speak up for me. I just said to him, did you see what happened? And he said, yes, this is what happened. And he was willing to speak to Amkar Maharaj on my behalf. And I left that message on the 26th at 7.13 p.m. Amkar Maharaj did not call me back until the 27th of October at 1.07 p.m. And what he said to me, he is closing the grievance. Because the manager told me to do something and I didn't do it. Amkar Maharaj said he is not going to view the, camp, the video because it's not available. How convenient. And that he wasn't going to speak to the witness. And that he was closing the grievance. So I was written up for insubordination when Ali Shabid lied about everything. And Brian also lied. Well, if Ron Robinson can be believed, because he may not even have spoken to Brian. So maybe Brian didn't lie. Maybe it was just Ron Robinson lying again like he did about Rohan Kalu. Yeah. So.
So, on January 10th, when Ron Robinson lied about Rohan Kalu, he told me, sue him. Well, I'm doing that. He has a habit of telling me to sue him. So I'm taking him up on that. No. The other thing is Ronald Robinson. You have behaved in a manner that is inappropriate to your position. And I have four words for you. V video? Or maybe it's three words. Let me see when I'm finished. Videos. Female. Insubordinates. Or no. Female subordinates. It's four words. Phone, video, female subordinates. And now I'm asking for your resignation. As a matter of fact, I'm demanding your resignation because you and other managers at Pure, Pure Later have behaved in a manner that is inappropriate to your positions. And that's where I'm going next. Telephone, videos, female. Subordinates. You think about the inappropriateness of that. This is David. And Goliath has just ran into David. I am at peace with myself. I am at peace with my world. And I am at peace with my Awa, the giver of breath, the ancient of days, Yahawa, Ahaya, the most high. The Creator, I wish you Baruch and Shalom.